Welcome to the Corporate Law Lab. I'm Neil Taylor, Director of the Corporate Law Center at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Our guest today is Scott Kane, partner at Squire Pot and Boggs and co-chair of the firm's global litigation practice. Scott and I had a wide-ranging conversation that included important themes like the importance of communications and candor and the relationships between outside and corporate counsel, understanding the realities of what can and can't be accomplished in litigation, and sound advice on how to build a career by finding what works for you and focusing on providing excellent service. Welcome, Scott. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started um, I, on kind of the main topic, let's just talk about how did you decide to become a lawyer? Um, how did you end up in Cincinnati? It's a good question as to how I decided to become a lawyer. Maybe there's two parts of the of the answer, neither compelling. One is I recall when I was a child, I told my grandfather. I was going to be a lawyer, and I have no idea why. I have no recollection of anything that made me think or say that, but apparently I, apparently I did. Uh, fast forward some number of years, and the why I became a lawyer after uh, graduation from college. Well, first, I was a college dropout for some number of years, uh, went back to college, graduated. I graduated in four years, just not four years in a row. And once I earned my philosophy degree, I faced the choice of going back to bartending or going to law school. So I chose to go to law school. Uh, I'm being a little bit facetious. I had at least some interest in it, but there wasn't a grand plan of proceeding to become a lawyer. So did your family remind you that that had been your childhood dream when you decided to pursue it? Yeah, they uh, they had commented on that a number of times. And again, I, I remember saying that to my grandfather, and I just don't remember why or whatever made me say that. As far as ending up in Cincinnati, in those days, there was a paper book of all of the accredited law schools in the United States. And when you were deciding where to apply, you could thumb through that book and see a profile of the schools. And I, someone had told me to look at Case Western, and I was looking at Case Western, and I turned the page, and literally the next page was the University of Cincinnati. And from that utter coincidence, I started reading about Cincinnati and quickly concluded it was better than Case Western, by the way, <laughs> and sent an application to Cincinnati. Uh, I'd never been to the city of Cincinnati before that and was accepted and given some scholarship money. So I showed up and here I am. And you've been here ever since. I've been here ever since. So when you were doing your non-consecutive undergrad, at some point you entered the Army. I did. How did um, your Army experience influence your law school experience um, first and then your career afterwards, if it did? I think it did. It's hard to articulate exactly how. It's not like I learned something in the Army that directly trans something substantive that directly translates to the practice of law. But I would say, well, number one, I learned not to be a screw up and to go back to college and actually go to class this time. But I think being in the military teaches you to shut up and get the job done. If that's not being too facetious, there's, I don't know how to articulate that attitude, but there's a story I always tell where I was bartending and one of the other bartenders that had been a Marine, this was the summer before I went back to college, and the manager came by. I was in the army. He was in a marine. He had been a marine. I liked him anyway. The manager came by and said, "We need to move that table to a different part of the the bar." So we walked over and picked up the table and asked, "Where do you want us to move it?" And he started laughing, and we were somewhat bemused, saying, "What's so funny?" And his answer was. 
I tell you former military guys to move a table, you pick it up and say where. If I told anyone else to move it, I'd have a five minute conversation about why do we need to move the table? So maybe somehow someone can distill out of that some attitude that translates to practicing law. And do you think it, if, and I, in my experience, I wasn't in the army. I was selling windows and doors for a couple of years in between undergrad and, and grad school. But I think it helped me approach law school like a job instead of like an academic experience that was 10 times more intense than undergrad where going to class was kind of optional. Yeah, I don't know. I, I loved law school. Like uh, there was no. I, that's what I'm saying. From yeah. Law school, I loved. Yes. Undergrad, I could take it or leave it. Yeah. And I don't think that if I hadn't had those two years in between, where I had to get up in the morning and go do something every day, that I would have had the same approach to law school that I had if I hadn't had that experience. Yeah, that's a possibility, I suppose, for me. I guess the other the other thing I would say it brings to my experience particularly at this part of my career, managing other lawyers as part of my job, I would tell you it, I, it brings the mentality of the number one most important thing is getting the mission done, but the number two most important thing is taking care of your team and looking out for their welfare, including so that when you ask, have to ask them to do very hard things to get the mission done, they will be both able and willing to do that because you've done number two when number one calls. Why did you choose litigation when you graduated from law school? Or did you did it choose you or did you choose it? it, it like you'll accuse me of, of not really having any plan whatsoever, but it was sort of the path of least resistance, I suppose. I uh, had a summer associate job after my first year and summer associate positions, litigation tends to lend itself it's to summer associate projects. It's easier to break out a discrete piece. Uh, so I started doing litigation related work uh, and kept doing that work and the firm seemed to like it. And uh, I, that's where I ended up. I had some affinity for it. I'm not saying I didn't think about it at all. At the beginning of that summer, I will tell you this, and I tell this to students and, and prospective summer associates when I interview them and encourage them to keep an open mind. For some reason, before that summer job, I had an idea I wanted to be a trust and estates lawyer. And I showed up for my summer associate position and did a trust and estates project and quickly concluded I never want to do that again. So I didn't conclude that regarding litigation and was asked to join the litigation group. And here I am. You know, I had to dig out my transcript when I um, applied for this job at the university. And I saw these labor law um, classes that I took. And I'm thinking, why was I doing that? I would, and I realized, oh, yeah, I thought I was going to be a labor lawyer. And I did like one labor and employment case. And they said, what would you like to do? And I was like, commercial litigation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, our, our first idea, and I think it's one of the themes of this podcast, is be open um, because what you think you might be interested in, you might be right. I mean, I certainly went to school with people, you know, Mike Schwartz, I don't know if you know Mike, um, he knew he wanted to be a tax lawyer the day he got here, uh -huh. and he still is, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and that's the experience of some people, but I don't think it's the experience of most people. Yeah, and again, as I, I counsel people, even people like that, it's good that you know what you want to do, but keep an open mind, and if nothing else have some experiences that confirm that. Right. So you've been a litigator now for 25 plus years. I guess before we get into the what's changed over that time, uh, we were having a discussion right before we started about litigators as problem solvers. And I don't think that is how people actually perceive 
litigators in the outside, you're perceived more as an, an attack dog. Do you see yourself more as a you know hired gun or as somebody that is dedicated to um, solving a client's problem? Well, as aspirationally the latter, and those are the best client relationships where clients reach out to you before there is litigation. Uh, Look, I make a living from doing litigation, and one of the things I do for clients is try to find every way possible to keep them out of litigation. And one of the things I tell them is, you know who litigation is good for? Me. You know who litigation is not good for? You. So I absolutely do not view myself as only the person who shows up after the acute problem it occurs, i.e. the filing of litigation. I think it's important for all lawyers, regardless of their primary practice area, to have a broad perspective on things. I know a lot about corporate governance. There's a corporate partner in our firm. I forget his term he uses, corpagators or something, and his <laughs> view is like, well, you're a litigator, but I can talk to you about corporate governance and fiduciary duties, and you know the law and he's a corporate partner, but he understands litigation, that non-narrow perspective on legal practice is invaluable, and it's what serves clients the best. Do you think it's unusual, or is it becoming more required of lawyers and in, in law firms to have that kind of broader view beyond their specialty? Uh, I don't know if it's unusual, but it's it's not... It's not ubiquitous that many practitioners uh, have that perspective on things. There's this countervailing notion that clients demand that they want specialists, which is great, but being a specialist doesn't mean you have to be ignorant of other areas of the law. So talking about the changes that have occurred over these I would say many years, but I've been at it for even longer than you, so. That's okay, I, um, I say the same thing. Technology is a huge difference, I assume, in how litigators do their work as opposed to how it was when we started. Technology is a huge issue, uh, generally, and one aspect of technology writ broadly is electronic discovery. When I started practicing not too long ago, uh, I speak to Professor Salamini's class about electronic discovery every year. And when I say I started practicing not too long ago, I say every year that's a little bit more of a lie. But within one generation or one legal career that is not yet completed, discovery was still primarily paper-based. Large, multi-million dollar cases might have a record of a box or less than 10 boxes of paper documents that was manageable. Electronic discovery has changed all of that and not the technology component of it alone, but the volume of discovery material and dealing with that format has radically changed discovery. And it's one of the things that have contributed to the increasing cost of litigation. Uh, litigation is much more expensive and much riskier for defendants than it used to be. That's another thing that's changed. And then working with corporate counsel, I think corporate counsel, when you graduated in 97, correct? Yes. Okay, so that, that's when I went from being in out side litigator to in-house litigation manager. Um, and you're absolutely right. Discovery was almost all paper um, back in those days. Um, but I think that was kind of the beginning of the, what I would call kind of a corporate counsel revolution, where corporate counsel became more and more involved in the strategy and the daily handling of litigated cases. How have you seen that change over over time in your dealings with corporate counsel and whether they're you know, more involved, how are they involved differently? 
how has that evolved or has it stayed the same? I, I don't know that I perceive an evolution or a unitary evolution. To me, it really varies from client to client and uh, within that variation, two of the issues are the size of the client, how many in-house counsel they have and how specialized they are. Um, and then the sophistication of the client with respect to litigation. It is clearly the case that clients are managing their litigation risk more than they used to and are more involved in, in that aspect of things. Some clients are very involved from the outset strategically. They want to be involved in other clients. It's not like they're checking out, but they're view is closer to, I'm hiring you to take care of this. I want you to advise me. I want to hear your advice and react to it, but I'm relying on you to guide me through this process. When I was managing litigation, I always found that I needed to kind of pull myself back every once in a while and remind myself that I wasn't handling the day-to-day -day of it. And it wasn't because it upset outside counsel. They were always happy to take whatever input you give them. Um, it was more that if I started making the little decisions, I felt like I needed to make all of them. Um, and I tried to model myself on GCs that I had worked with who were very involved in setting the strategy and not so concerned about my word choice on page 13 of a 15-page brief. Um, when you look at your relationships with, with corporate counsel, what makes you go, this is great, this is exactly how it should be working, and, and on, on the other side, is there something to be like, gosh, I wish they'd stop that? The num uh, a couple things come to mind in response to that question, Neil. One is the absolute best thing is open communication, and by open, candid communication. So the ability to have a relationship with corporate counsel where you can strip away the, I don't want to say politeness in the sense that it's there's friction or something, but you can, both sides can say what they feel and what they want without a lot of pretense associated with it. And my attitude is I need to be able to tell you what I think you should do and why I sometimes uh, say, like, my greatest strength as a lawyer might be I tell clients what I think and not necessarily what they want to hear always. And maybe sometimes my greatest weakness as a lawyer is I tell clients <laughs> what I think and not always what they want to hear. But being able to do that, have a give and take, and then to move on from there, including it may be that I advise the client to do X and the client says, I understand your advice, but I want to do Y. I don't have a problem with that. That's the client's prerogative. I struggle with it when I don't think they've listened to me about why I think they should do X. So the ability to have that frank and substantive communication, I think, is the number one thing. I'll shut up in a minute here, but the number two thing I would say is some unsophisticated or I should say less sophisticated people not really understanding what's achievable in litigation or not and trying to pursue ends through litigation that are never going to be achievable, that dynamic can is difficult to manage sometime. I will say that's more of a business person issue than it is an in-house counsel issue. Yeah, I had, I'll give you an example from my career where we had a, um, a merger where we were attempting to buy a company. We did buy the company and the people that came with the company were massively important to the merger because it was a sales-based company. And one of our competitors tried to poach, you know, hired one person to go in and hire other people in violation of trade secrets, et cetera, et cetera. I went and got a preliminary injunction and kept those guys on the sideline for 12 weeks, which was a massive victory sure. if you've done that kind of litigation. 
and was viewed by the clients as a massive defeat because they were going to be back in three months doing what we want them to stop doing. Right. And, and I think that's the kind of where you have a client that isn't realistic about what they can achieve, that that can become very difficult for the litigator. I mean, have you had examples like that? And, and what's the general subject that comes up when, the, when you go different ways in terms of this is my advice? Is it at the settlement point, whether to try the case, whether to write a summary judgment motion? It, it can vary. The worst situation is where, a, again, a less sophisticated or more emotional client thinks they're going to achieve something in litigation that is not achievable. Uh, lots of commercial litigation is about money. And as I like to say, you, if you're suing someone, you know, the day it feels good, the day you file the complaint and every day after that, it probably feels less good, but you're not going to get some emotional vindication more than nine times out of 10 in litigation. You're going to achieve a financial result after investing a lot of resources pursuing it, but you're never going to achieve a result where the judge points at you from the bench and says, you were right all along. I'm sorry this happened to you. I apologize to you on behalf of the legal system. That never happens. And people who think they're going to achieve emotional vindication out of litigation are frequently disappointed. And those clients that end up settling the case because the exigencies of litigation are such that almost all cases settle walk away from the experience disheartened often. Yes, because they've approached it with, I'm going to say, irrational expectations about what they can achieve. So a corollary of all this is the best relationships between outside counsel and in-house counsel, both in litigation and in any other legal matter, involve a discussion up front of what are we trying to achieve here and how are we going to develop a strategy to pursue that rather than let's start a process and see what happens and after we're several months or years into it, we'll start thinking about a strategy for resolving it. I think that's a poor approach to litigation and a poor approach to most legal matters. And I think something that we don't think about so much when we see a wrong that's been done is damages from the from the start. I, I was lucky enough to work for a lawyer, um, Peter Baird, who insisted that we look at damages before we gave any advice to the client because, you know, that's the point at the end of the day. It's not about winning or it's not just about winning or losing. It's about what is it going to cost? What can you achieve? What's it going to cost you to get there? which is, I think, a good segue to budgeting and cost control. You were, you were talking about irrational expectations. Maybe that's, this is the place for that. When we talk with um, in-house counsel on this podcast, um, I think all of them so far have brought up you know, budgeting and not wanting to be surprised. And, and litigation is an imperfect science to predict at the very least. How do you approach the desire for certainty from your clients with the fact that there's no such thing? It, number one thing goes back to communication. As you said, in-house counsel don't like surprises. So the more you can communicate about what the expectation is, the better served both sides will be. And see, I wish I had you as a client. So appreciating the inherent unpredictability of litigation uh, is it makes it very hard to set a, a budget or an estimate with, with complete reliability because something's going to happen that you don't expect. You have another party beyond your control who's doing things. They're frequently going to do things that you don't anticipate, including because it might not be reasonable. So no one would have ever predicted they would do that because that's a dumb thing to do, but yet they still did it and you have to address it in litigation. So the way I approach that is when you give cost estimates, 
give, identify the premises on which they're based. Here's an estimate. Here's the assumptions that underlie that estimate. We're going to have X number of depositions. The case is probably going to be resolved at this phase. Here's what the scope of discovery is going to be. And then at least it's a meaningful estimate because you can see what the buildup to it is. And then back to the subject that we're talking about, when the unpredictable or unexpected thing happens that alters a premise on which the budget is based, then you need to communicate that with in-house counsel. Something has changed about the scope, the nature, the exposure has changed. We didn't think there would be a counterclaim. You should always think there's going to be a counterclaim, but uh, that's an absurdly simple example. Don't wait to have that discussion with them at the end of the matter or when you've sent them a much larger bill than they're expecting. Have that discussion. The scope has changed. The nature has changed. Therefore, the budget has is changed. And you can get caught up in the, the moment of you're not going to keep to yourself that this has happened, that plaintiff's counsel has now managed to expand the scope of discovery far beyond we ever thought it would happen. You'll convey that message where some lawyers fail is saying, and that's going to make it more expensive. And this is how much more I think it's going to make it expensive instead of, well, you knew he got the the scope of discovery expanded. Of course you should have expected a big bill. And it goes back again, to communication and candor. Some people don't like to deliver unpleasant news, but as as you just said, you're going to deliver unpleasant news eventually. <laughs> the question is when and how, so why don't you just address it head on and have the meaningful conversation with the client about what the change in circumstances means, including economically. How often do you bring up alternative dispute resolution as the as the first one suggesting that a mediation and you know baseball arbitration different ways of going about it and how often is it coming from the client or is it just a step in the process now it's a step in the process i think most people expect that you're going to do it often it comes from courts and i would say particularly in the last eight to 10 years, courts are more aggressive about pushing it. And you'll see many federal districts have local rules or standing orders about referral to alternative dispute resolution and what track you're going to be on. It, so it happens in most large matters. It's a question of when is it going to be most effective. I, I will tell you frequently it's not as effective at the beginning of the case without some discovery or I don't want to be too sarcastic. Sometimes the parties need to beat up on each other a little bit and then a mediation or direct settlement discussions have a greater chance of being fruitful than the day the answer and counterclaim are filed when positions are, are more rigid. Um, the other thing that we hear a lot from um, in-house counsel is talking about alternative fee arrangements, and we haven't done a ton of these uh, yet, but generally I would say that in-house counsel's view of how alternative fee arrangements work out, I haven't heard anybody terribly positive about it yet. Um, what, what's your feeling on it? And, and try not to let the fact that I've just exposed my view <laughs> well, influence your answer. Well, it, it wouldn't because my view starts out the same. And uh, I'll try not to go on too long. You can interrupt me and we can break it down in pieces. But you would know better than I as more of an academic. But my guess is if you look back decades ago, you will see all kinds of legal writing predicting the demise of the billable hour. And you know what? The billable hour is not only still around, it's still the predominant fee approach because it has utility. It's easy to understand. It's easy to measure. When something unexpected happens in 
a transaction or a case, you can account for that through a billable hour and those discussions. It's harder to account for it in an alternative fee arrangement. So it's hard to predict all of those things that get to an alternative fee arrangement that is going to account for what happens months and years in, including those unexpected things. With all of that said, people talk about alternative fee arrangements 10 times or more than they actually do them. So sometimes I find myself when the client says, we really want an alternative fee arrangement for this, I'll come up with terms and I'll propose an alternative fee arrangement and it will have different you know, potential outcomes and I'll propose that and they look at it and say, whoa, this is kind of complicated. How about you give us an X percent discount to your standard fees and that's more often than, more often than not what happens. If I'm not going on too long, I'll say- Keep going. Please. I'll say a couple more things. It, where I've had the most success in using them and I think clients like them is the built, the, a success component built in, not necessarily a, a contingency or a pure contingency, but here's, here's the billing terms we're going to give you. If we accomplish outcome X, which you would be very happy about, then maybe we get a premium on our normal billing rates instead of a discount to them. And if the case goes a little longer into outcome Y, here's the outcome. Not only do clients like those because they get better terms on the front end, but they feel like, hey, this aligns the law firm's uh, incentive with mine to resolve the case as efficiently as possible. Now, I want to circle back to one more thought on this, but I'm going off on another tangent. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll bring us back. If, in if in-house counsel, or, or at least the, the more the ones who make more cavalier comments about it, have this idea like law firms aren't incentivized to be efficient, or they just want to chin hours on the file and bill as many hours as they can to send us a large bill as possible. I, I don't agree with that perspective. And if there are outside counsel who do that, it's a little naive because what I say is it's great that you hired me for a matter. I'm going to make some money from that. That's good for my business. That's the business I'm in. But I don't want your one matter. I want to do a good job and a cost-effective job so I can get matters two through 10 and beyond. And if I'm sending you a big bloated bill that's not appropriate for resolution of that matter, I'm radically diminishing my chances of, of achieving that. So, you know, engine I mean, over. No, I, I never felt that way as in-house counsel that you weren't incentivized to be um, as efficient as possible because I had a litigation portfolio and I knew you wanted your fair share or your bigger share than the other guy down the street of that portfolio. And to get that, I had to be kept reasonably happy. Sure. So I never felt like we were at cross purposes in that way. I will tell you the where where I sat that I felt that way about efficiency was as a law firm associate. You know, when I would crank out a 15-page brief in, you know, three hours of research and three hours of writing and it's done, and that didn't happen every day, but occasionally it did. Right. It felt when you're up against minimum billable hours like you've just punished yourself, you know, because the person down the hall would have done that in 14 hours. And in the firm's mind, that person just made, you know, two and a half times the money you brought into the firm that day. Yeah. And without discounting that, because the, there is an element of that to the, the nature of law practice, when you're in my seat and you're the partner looking at the bill, I'm going to be have a more favorable view of Neil got this done in three hours. I'm going to send the next one of these to him because he gets it and he's efficient 
versus this person build 14 hours. I can't build a client 14 hours for that task. I'm going to have to chop this down to right. something less. And then it's a headache for the partner in the billing relationship. Um, unless I guess you're in the position of just passing on the 14 hours and that doesn't seem appropriate on either side. Yeah. And I think the law firm, if it is well managed, sees that. You know, and in my career, it didn't become a big issue, but because I was fairly efficient, I got to work on more important matters with the, you know, the John Franks and Janet, Napol Janet Napolitanos of the world. Sure. You know? If I can circle back to the alternative mm -hmm. fee arrangement um, issue, I think where it works best is where there is an ongoing relationship between the firm and client and you both know there are going to be a lot of future matters. So if there is an alternative fee arrangement term and it produces a result that skews one way or another more so than may have been expected, where both sides can say like, well, I didn't come out great on that one, but we're going to have lots more and it all even out in the end. Or when you can say, and I've I've done this as outside counsel sometimes, like, hey, an unexpected thing happened that was good for you. Like, so this resolved much quicker. I'm not going to stick it to you on these terms. We're going to alter the terms in your favor because they need to be altered the same way as if I was going to spend much more time. And it's easier and more productive to do that when there is that existing and continuing relationship. Yeah, I think my experience with flat fee arrangements always worked worst when it was a one-off. Um, and I think as in-house counsel, we blamed it on you. We said, oh, he's keeping score. He's still keeping score the old way. Mm -hmm. So he knows at the end of that flat fee deal, whether or not he won or lost, comparing how much time was put in against the billable hour. And if you're having a relationship, a professional relationship between in-house and outside counsel, having one feel like they won or lost doesn't produce a healthy, happy, long-term relationship. I agree with that. And it, it sounds like I'm up on my soapbox on, on this issue of economics, but the best client relationships are the ones that you really have this partnering relationship that everyone talks about. And that's, in my view, what how outside counsel should approach every relationship in the ones where it's not possible to achieve that. And when there's, you know, these less productive discussions around economics, like my attitude is, if you don't trust me not to cheat you on a bill, like why would you ever hire me to represent your very important interest here? Like, like if we don't have that level of trust that I'm not out to take advantage of you, why would you ever hire me to protect your interest if, if you don't trust me at that basic level? Trust has to be earned, I get that, but. I remember in the early 90s, Billing guidelines and billing review software became all the rage. And I would receive from my client something saying, we will not pay for intra-firm conferences, which had zero impact on whether or not intra-firm con conferences would happen. It changed how they were described on the bill. I think that's right. And... I actually, in the guidelines I produced when I became in-house, said intrafirm conferences are not prohibited. They're expected as long as it's to make the matter more efficiently handled. I, I don't want to sound sycophantic, but <laughs> like, I 100% agree with you. Like, you don't want the experienced partner explaining to the associate who's going to do the work what the best, most strategic way to approach it is, that is absolute client value. Now, I will say it, it's, it's a rough and poor barometer for what clients don't want to pay for. I would say, and this is the conversation I have with young associates in the firm, you need to ask yourself, 
is what you're doing valuable to the client and is it advancing the client's objective for how we're going to favorably conclude this matter, whether it's litigation or a regulatory matter or a transaction and you're doing it, always remember you're doing it for the client and if it's not producing value to the client, then do it a different way. And that's what clients care about. They, don't, they wanna feel like they're not getting nickel and dimed for things that aren't advancing their interest. Back in the day when the fax machine was a big profit center for law firms, <laughs> right? <laughs> and copiers. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we've talked quite a lot about relationship management. It was the next thing on the outline, but I'm not sure what else we have to talk about there. Other than, um, I mean, the, the question I was going to ask you, I'll just throw it out anyway, and you can decide whether or not it's already been covered, is what can they do to make your job easier in-house counsel? Communicate what the expectations are. Communicate, like, if there are dynamics going on that I'm not going to appreciate because of some internal uh, I'll just say internal politics or as an example or some other internal dynamic that I'm not aware of. If I'm trying to drive the matter in one direction from my perspective and I don't appreciate the, the internal dynamic and you're pushing back on me all the time, that's not going to compute with me because you haven't shared that there's another consideration that I don't know about. So I sound like a broken record, but back to communication, back to managing expectations of business people in larger corporations. In-house counsel have clients just like I do. Their clients are the business people. The best in-house counsel, in my estimation, are the ones that are advising those clients and not just I get frustrated with the dynamic of like, we can't do that. The The business person's not going to like that answer. And my response is, well, that's the answer. But we both know that's the answer. So are you not going to tell them the answer because you're afraid of what they will say? It's your job to advise them the same way it's my job to advise both of you. I was thinking about our earlier conversation about what in-house counsel want to pay for and what they don't. And I think the one sticking point is feeling like you are paying for the law firm to train their associates not to provide, not for their, their legal expertise. And then the question becomes, well, how are they going to learn? But, you know, a lot of the rules that many of us have had as, as in-house counsel are about the lawyer who is obviously there, you know, when I was third chair on the first deposition I ever went to, I'm assuming that the, that the client paid for it. I can tell you the amount of value I was adding, and it used to freak me out. It was, I think my billing rate was $105, but it was like, oh my God, somebody just paid $330 for me to sit and stare for three hours watching somebody do a deposition. There's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> no, I understand the question. And it, it is like clients shouldn't be paying for things that are pure training and are not contributing value to their matter. On the other hand, things that are contributing value but also achieve on-the-job training are not inappropriate because the associate happens to be learning at the same time they're doing work. I will tell you the way I approach it, Neil, and I've been pretty successful at the economic portion of my job, so no one has to worry that I'm not attuned to the business of, of law or that somehow I'm just this noble person who's always like, <laughs> I don't want to make any money, but I routinely, maybe, maybe I scrutinize bills and I routinely cut the number of hours that I will bill the client for what the associate did. If the associate performed task X and it 
they build eight hours and in my view it should have only taken four then I build a client four and not eight the other thing I do is sometimes I will just tell the client I want to bring the associate to the deposition because it'll be good for them I won't bill you for it it, it just goes back to if you communicate with clients, you tell them and they can trust and rely on what you're saying, not only about substance, but about economics and the business side, that engenders a positive relationship that's going to be good for you in the long run. And I don't know how to do it any other way. So I just say, tell them what I think. And that seems to have worked out okay. There were certainly times I was second chairing a deposition where it was not a fly on the wall, you know, back in the day of the, you know, I was in Phoenix, Arizona too, so it really was the Wild West once upon a time. Sure. And you had these trial lawyers who would discover a case as they were trying it. And in those situations, the second chair is absolutely essential because that's the only person that knows the case in the room. Yes. It, a little bit of a tangent, but it at least broadly touches on this. This story sticks in my mind company who's a large client of mine still, I once, once one of their in-house counsel called me about a new matter and I told him like, we can do this for you, but I wouldn't hire us for it. You don't, you don't need us to do this. We, we wouldn't be as efficient. Here's the firm you should hire to do this. And he was dumbfounded and said like, no lawyers ever told me that before. I'm like, what are you talking about? They should tell you that. And what I told him, again, explicitly, which is kind of my style, is, okay, well, I told you that. And next time I tell you you should hire me for something and we are the best fit for this, you better believe me because I've developed trust of saying, here's a better way for you to go for, for this particular matter. I actually have a story that ties into that that ties the whole podcast series together because I called Jordan Green, who we'd had on an earlier episode, who's a white collar criminal defense lawyer in Phoenix, um, seeking a referral for export compliance. And he said, not only am I not the right guy, there's no one in Phoenix you should talk to. You need to call this guy at Patton Boggs, your firm in DC. Sure. And he was absolutely right. And it, you know, it gave me, I already trusted Jordan, um, a lot, but it, it kind of, you know, it reaffirmed that this was the right person to be taking these kind of issues to because he would not take the work if he wasn't the best person to do it. Yes. So it, it would be a whole other podcast for the advice I give to associates, but I will uh, about client relationships and client development. But one piece of it that bears on what both of us has said have said is the practice of law is a big part of it is a relationship business, particularly at the partner level. And if it depends on relationships, you better have good ones because you've earned trust and you've earned a reputation for doing a good job so that the client can rely on you and you're going to get those kinds of calls. Let me head us off in a completely different direction and talk about transactional lawyers more generally. Um, you know, I've had the experience of doing deals in common law jurisdictions and in civil law jurisdictions. And I remember buying a 150 million euro business in Germany on the basis of a 33 page um, sale and pur purchase agreement. Um, Whereas the same deal in the U.S. would have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. So I have a little bit of a weird view of, of the entire subject. But do deal lawyers ever come to you and say, how do you think this is going to play in litigation? Or do you end up just getting the mess of paperwork long after? Sometimes they come to me in those circumstances, I would say not enough. And usually when they come to me, like, how is this going to play in litigation? There, there is the distant early warning on the horizon that they think their parties are going to end up in a dispute. 
in, let's contrast with that, your average deal. I think it's rare, not unheard of, but still somewhat uncommon that there's a built-in litigation component review of a transaction, which, which I think is a huge lost opportunity in many respects because there, there can be advantages to how the deal is structured and written. I'll, now I'm going off on yet another tangent. I, I'm not ignorant to what it takes to get a big deal done. And sometimes if you're looking at section 42 of the stock purchase agreement, and you read it later after the fact, and you say, how did it end up like this? What you don't appreciate it is there were 20 turns of the document between the parties and incremental, like, I want to change this clause in the third sentence. Well, if you change that clause, but you still have to view it as if there is a dispute about that, how is it going to appear to the judge or jury later who did not live through the weeks or months of getting it done and does what the contract says actually convey the party's intent or what they think it says with the benefit of all that mental gloss of how section 42 ended up that way rather than what someone reads it without any context on that page and says, here's what I think it means. So I'll shut up in a minute here again, but I'm harsh sometimes on my transactional colleagues who try to like, oh, it's very complicated uh, M&A thing. You wouldn't understand it. And my reaction is, I understand it. It's a contract that's going to need to be enforced. And let me tell you my perspective on it. Like a uh, blowhard M&A lawyer, you have one <laughs> concept that's addressed in three different sections of the agreement. Put them all in one section. You don't need five defined terms in this section. You can distill it down to three. So it's not just about getting the deal done. It, and look, we have phenomenal M&A lawyers. None of this is a slight towards them. I'm just, it, with younger practitioners in that area, it's about getting the deal done in a way that makes sense where you don't end up with a 200-page agreement when the 33-page one would be just fine. Uh, I have like so many thing, areas I can go off on based on that. Um, I always felt like, you know, and I transitioned from being um, a litigator to pretty much an in-house deal lawyer. And I never felt like those things that were heavily negotiated, fine. You know, you can tell me, yeah, it doesn't say what you think it says or nobody's going to read it that way. And I'll be like, yep, I understand. But I was in the room and this is the best I could do to get the deal over the, over the line. What will drive me insane is if the stuff that was never discussed ends up being the features of litigation. And that's where the, that's definitely in the difference between the 33 and the 200. All the stuff that's in there that are like, you know, little traps for finding out when you're on the stand three years later in litigation, it, that that's in there. And we never discussed it in which might conflict with the highly negotiated piece because no one really paid attention to it. And the, the, I bet, well, I would predict you would agree with this again, without criticizing anyone, but sometimes the answer is to why is this language in the agreement is because it was in the model I started with and I wasn't really sure we should take it out. So I left it in there and no one objected to it. So my view is, Words matter, right? That th the elegance of a contract is you get to define, both sides get to define what the legal obligations are. So you ought to be asking yourself in all of the agreement, why is this in here and why does it say this instead of something different? And if the answer is to either of those questions is, I don't know, then as to your point, there's a big question about 
whether it belongs in there or not, or at least whether it belongs in there in that way. And then there's the agreements that, like you were saying, it's in the definitions and then it's somewhere else. And, you know, trying to read what the parties have agreed to, you almost say, please send me the term sheet so I can understand what they were trying to accomplish because as I'm reading, you know, the key clauses, it's sending me to four different definitions and it takes me a half hour to figure out what this sentence says. Yes, and maybe this is a whole other podcast as well, but not only in litigation, but also in contract writing and any legal writing, I find myself frequently saying to younger lawyers, like, I don't understand this paragraph. What are you trying to say here? Well, I'm trying to say blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that sounds a lot better. Why don't you say blah, 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 instead of this long blowhard language that you Makes actually it look wrote. like you went to law school. Yeah, yes. great. You went to law school. I get it. You wrote a very long paragraph. Maybe you could write the short paragraph that says what you're trying to accomplish here. Yes. And the best writing is are things that are is very clear and communicates exactly what you're intending to communicate, again, in my view. So believe it or not, we've been going for almost an hour. Uh, wow. Yeah. And, and I don't think any of them were tangents, by the way. Okay. Um, so I, I just have one more question, and it's not on the list. If you could go back to 1995 when you're entering law school, what would you like to tell yourself that, that 1995 Scott was very worried about that, that 1995 Scott should just let go? Oh, gosh. Having to know all the answers uh, with, without asking questions, that's a, like, and I was never shy about asking questions, so, but... Like, I don't, I don't know, but things will, it's good to want to prepare and it's good to want to succeed. But if you do a good job and are earnest and approach things in good faith, a lot of things professionally will take care of themselves. So uh, I didn't really have a safety net though. I had that bartending job waiting for me still, but <laughs> so, so I, I made sure I was going to succeed in law school and that served me well. Um, I spent a lot of time at Uncle Woody's across the street from law school as well. So I don't know. I just to, I don't know if I'm answering the question or if I even have a good answer. I tell a lot of younger people in that situation of 1995, Scott, just remember this isn't just a job, it's a profession. So learn, take the opportunity to learn, take the opportunity to be involved in things, get to know things and learn from more senior lawyers who have been doing this for a long time. So I don't know that I've really answered your question, but some something in that vein about approaching things in, in that manner rather than feeling like I need to be prepared to succeed at every turn. And, and I think the first closing argument I ever saw in person was done by Bob Pitcairn. And, you know, Bob from, uh, yeah. from Cat's Teller, unbelievable advocate. And it really scared me to death because, I mean, it was a case about a loading dock construction and, you know, the way Bob um, unfolded his closing argument was, you know, Shakespearean. And I was like, oh, God, I could never be that. I'm going to be so bad at this by comparison. And I've discovered in, you know, the 35 years since that I've never seen another closing argument, even about things far more important than a loading dock case that approached what Bob Pitcairn did in Carl Rubin's court that day. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, I think it's, you see the pinnacle of something and you go, okay, that's the baseline and it's not, you know? Yes. The other thing I would tell people and probably still not an answer to your specific question is you have to find your own way of doing things. And if you are trying to do it the way someone else does it, it's not a fit for you, you're not going to be successful. So you 
approach things in the way that makes sense for you. So maybe the advice I would give to 1995, Scott, is like just worry about finding the way that works for you. And it thankfully, it's ended up that way in my career, back to the client relationships and candor and things like that's just who I am. So that's the way I approach things. And if if clients trust you and feel like you're being genuine with them, that has worked out well for me. If I tried to be the cocktail party guy, that's not who I am. And if that's the the way I approached things, it wouldn't have worked out quite as well for me as my guess. Great. Do you guys have any questions? We're good. You're good. Honestly, I would say, um, like, what's your advice for somebody that wants to go to the transactional world? What do you look for? In the in the transactional world, you have to express an interest in that area. Um, so make sure you're involved in that. Make sure you understand that if you're a young transactional lawyer, you're not going to be sitting in the conference room across the table negotiating things as a first year M&A associate. You're going to be doing due diligence and writing schedules to the asset purchase agreement and the like. Um, so I don't have advice that's going to necessarily give you a leg up in getting that job, but just versus do a good job in everything you do, express interest in that, express a substantive interest, read about it. Here's one piece of advice. I'll stop using the word tangent, but uh, uh, maybe I'm curmudgeonly about this, but I advise law students all the time. If your class starts with law and, it's probably going to be pretty fun and entertaining and five years after you're out of law school, it's probably going to be not very useful to you. But if you want to be a transactional associate, I would tell you do things like take securities regulation, because guess what? You're not going to have the opportunity to learn that yourself the same way you would from learning from a very good professor in law school. So take courses that are going to give you the baseline of knowledge that would make you a successful transactional lawyer. Thank you. Yeah, I would say take administrative law, which is not you know necessarily on the list because it will force you to be reading statutes and regulations and so much of what your clients want you to do as a, as a transactional lawyer is to put a deal together that is going to work in the context of the laws that they exist around, you know, and, and how to read those things and understand what you're doing. Um, I think you, you need that kind of experience in law school as much as you can get. I took a lot of bar classes. My theory was there's a reason they're on the bar because all lawyers need to know a little bit about them. The classes I didn't take that I wish I would have taken, even as a litigator, again, because it was my chance to learn about them in a, a really substantive, in-depth way, would be securities-related classes I've already mentioned, antitrust. I did not take an antitrust class in law school. I think if you want to be a transactional lawyer, that would serve you well. Um, lawyers... A shocking number of lawyers are financially illiterate and they don't know how to read a balance sheet or a profit and loss statement and knowing something about those, harder to get that in law school, but if you have some knowledge or that's going to serve you well, not only as a transactional lawyer, but as any lawyer. So like what sort of qualities don't say good? A new associate. What do you what do you look for? Uh, I, when an associate is already hired, I just gave a presentation to our class of new associates, and when we firm wide, we bring the associates together and do a multi day training presentation for them. And like the I said, the number one thing you can do is do a diligent 
thorough job on all of the work you're doing. And the number two best thing you can do is do a diligent, thorough job. And the number three best, so I was intentionally making a point, that's what's going to serve you well as a young associate in a law firm because it's an internal marketplace, right? When I have the next matter and I can pick from any number of associates and I say, I know he did that and I know he did it well and I know he did it thoroughly, then I'm more likely to come back to you the next time. The other thing I will tell you, and this is crucially important, is ask questions. You're not expected to know everything. Part of your job is to learn from more senior lawyers, and the best way to do that is to ask questions. It should be my job as the partner to train the associates, and I take that job very seriously, but it's also the associates' job, it's, it's their career, not mine, to seek out training, seek out feedback, and I'm always frustrated and bewildered by sometimes when I am in a meeting, I will say like, I didn't understand anything you just said. Say it again or explain it to me a different way. And many, many times the other people in the meeting will say, that's what I thought too. I'm so glad you asked that because I didn't understand it either. And my reaction is, well, if you didn't understand it, then why didn't you ask the question? Mm -hmm. Asking questions is not a sign of stupidity. It's a sign of intelligence. So learn, ask questions. If you don't understand why something was done a particular way, that's often the best way to learn. I'm going on too long, but when I was a young associate, I had the benefit of working with someone who would sit me down and we would go through all the revisions he would make to a piece of work. And sometimes I understood why the revisions were made and other times I got to hear him say, six months into this case, we're going to need to argue X and we want to be prepared for that. So I'm changing this now because it's going to better support that argument that we're going to make in the future and thinking about things that way. And like, we're doing this for a reason. Back to what Neil was saying. Why, was, why is that in the agreement? Why is it stated that way? Ask those questions. That's how you develop as a young lawyer. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you very much. I think this was great. I oh. really enjoyed it. Hope you hope it wasn't uh, wearing a hair shirt for an hour. It was not at all. I'm bound to have said <laughs> at least one thing that has some value, but I enjoyed it. Thank you, Scott. <laughs>